All right, at this point, I am gonna turn it over to Greg Fogarty. Go ahead, Greg. Well, good evening. Um, for those who don't know, my name is uh, Greg Fogarty, and this year I have been asked to perform the role of election coordinator. So tonight uh, we're officially announcing that nominations are open to be made, um, and they are for the positions of uh, the DAS official officer positions, I'm sorry, of president, vice president, secretary and treasurer. We also have eight trustee positions open for nomination. Uh, nominations will close at midnight on February the 4th. Any member in good standing of any, of, and of any age may cast a nomination. You also may self-nominate. Uh, one thing to note, if you nominate another person, that person will need to accept or decline their nomination. Uh, um, nominations can be made at uh, nominations at denverastro.com and I'm sure that will be posted. I'm sorry, Greg. If I wrote that down, it's denverastro.org. Oh, I apologize, denverastro.org. I'm sure it'll be posted online anyway. Mm -hmm. So at this time, I'd like to kick off if we've got any nominations either in person or online. You can do that by raising your hand. And I'll kick it off by no nominating Toby Sheets for one of the trustee positions, which he has okayed me to do. So if anybody has a nomination they'd like to make now, either online or uh, in person, please raise your hand. So Toby, do you accept that nomination? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Joe Gafford, who would you like to nominate? Uh, I'll take another uh, year of, uh, of trustees. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joe. And who else do we have? I think Joe Kozak had his hand up. No, he did. Okay, I'm sorry. Ron Rannick has his hand up. Yes, yes right. I do have my hand up and I will uh, nominate myself for a trustee position. Thank you, Ron. Okay. <clears throat> any other nominations? You got it, have you got any in person there, Dina? I'm not able to nominate anyone. No, I did. No, not you. Oh, Anybody sorry. in your audience? Oh, here in the audience. I don't see any hands up here. Is anybody here like to nominate mm -hmm. anyone? Toby, go ahead. I would like to nominate Doug Triggs uh, for president. Of oh. Wow. Very nice. Doug, do you accept? <laughs> Yay. Awesome. Very good. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for that. That at least gets it kicked off. Um, all nominees will need to submit a, a brief statement about themselves before March the 4th. Uh, these will be placed in our election system so voters can make it an informed decision. Um, the election will commence on March the 5th at 9 a.m. and will end on March at the March 12th meeting. Um, all members will receive an email invitation which will allow them to place their vote and the, the email will come from electionbuddy.com. So that's our kickoff. Uh, are there any questions or any comments or any concerns? Otherwise, nominations are open. We do have another nomination. Oh, okay. Uh, Joe Panetta votes Steve Barr for trustee. Steve, do you accept? Or tatters. Or tatters. Dogs don't qualify, sorry. Oh, okay. Do you accept, Steve? I accept. Thank you. All right. Um, I should also mention, uh, and everybody probably knows this, except for bundle members, each member can only cast one vote for each officer position and vote for up to eight trustees. Uh, 
bundle members, uh, votes will count for two votes for each person for whom they actually place a vote. And I think that's about it. Okay. Anybody else have someone in mind to nominate for any of the other positions? We, we have no nominations for vice president, secretary, or treasurer. Correct, yep. Go ahead, Doug. Okay, um, Toby has been nominated for secretary. Would you accept that rather than being nominated for trustee? I would like to, to talk to Alexander about the uh, the role, what it entails, but uh, I will accept the nomination for that. So we can still Right, and switch back to accepting the nomination for trustee. Yes. I, I think that's acceptable to all. Would would we all be in agreement on that? Those of you online and here? Well, well I couldn't hear him. What did he say? Um, Toby wants to talk to the um, existing secretary about the duties of secretary. Yeah, so for now, he wants to accept that nomination and reserve the right to go back and take the nomination for trustee if he changes his mind. Okay. I think that's acceptable. Um, Ron, would you be the person who would, I, I would respect your judgment on this. And Joe Gafford, would you have any objection to that? No objection. And I think that's acceptable. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll proceed with that. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, that's a good start, I think. So, excellent. Okay, very good. Well, Greg, I want to thank you for stepping forward to be our election coordinator this year. Um, we'll be sure everybody submits their uh, brief statements to you so that those can go on the Election Buddy website. And everybody will get a link to vote on Election Buddy uh, before that starts. So it's a very easy process. And it certainly has gotten more of our people to actually vote in the election. So uh, rather than, especially on a night like tonight, can you imagine having the election decided by just the people who are here? I've counted, and I don't think we have 20 people in attendance. It would be a shame to have 20 people determine who is on the executive board for a whole year, so. Okay, very good. All right, let's move on. Um, the next item is the Astronomy Minute by Joe Pineda. Okay, uh, so tonight uh, I'm going to give a, sort of a, an overview of the status of the uh, DAS Maker SIG. The Maker SIG is responsible for uh, well, not responsible for, but trying to make items for everyday astronomy, electronically assisted astronomy, and astrophotography. Uh, so over the past month, uh, the Maker SIG has been focusing on uh, making a Raspberry Pi uh, controller uh, for electronically assisted ast astronomy and astrophotography. Uh, we are uh, using the Raspberry Pi because you can get them at Micro Center for dirt cheap. They're like 75 bucks for an eight, eight gigabyte uh, version. Uh, and it has just about everything you need. It's using an ARM Cortex. Uh, I think it's a four CP. A little more volume. Oh, oh okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're using an ARM Cortex processor with four core CPU, uh, and uh, it's running at a speed of about 1.8 gigahertz. Um, you can get them at Micro Center for $75. And uh, I 3D printed a case for it. You can see it there in the picture. It's a little red box. I brought one with me. Um, it's right here, and I'll show it to you uh, during the meeting or afterwards uh, if you'd like to see the innards. Um, 
The case is 3D printed on a Bamboo Labs X1C printer, and I designed it in AutoCAD Fusion 360. Uh, I completed a successful test of the Raspberry Pi computer, uh, and I uh, integrated some uh, software in it that allows me to do plate solving, polar alignment, auto guiding, auto focus, calibration frames like darks, flats, flat darks, etc., and uh, automated go tos and meridian flips for astrophotography. Uh, I'm currently performing embedded software trade study with testing. Uh, I'm, I've tested it with uh, using various versions of Linux. Uh, the one that seems to work the best is Ubuntu. Uh, I'm using a server version of Ubuntu on this box. It's not the, uh, uh, the desktop version. It's a lot easier just to use the server. Um, and uh, for the laptop computer, it'll work with a PC laptop running Windows 11. Uh, it'll, I'm using my MacBook M2 uh, to talk to it as well works fine, and you and it's advertised to be able to work also with a uh, a Linux computer uh, running the program. I'll show you what all this means here in just a second. Um, and so, right in the middle of field tests right now. Uh, so, what is K? So, the software I'm using is called K Stars, and what I'm going to explain to you now is what what K Stars is and and uh, what, what exactly did I make. Um, K-STARS is like an all-in-one astronomy program like the Sky X. It's got the, uh, the planetarium program, the thing that allows you to select a target. It's got the astrophotography equipment, the, the part that allows you to point your telescope automatically, plate solve, and uh, precision point, and does autofocus and everything else that, say, NINA or uh, Sequence Generator Pro does, those types of programs. Uh, it's in the category of an all-in-one meaning it has all of these things in one piece of software. It's free. Uh, it's a, you can get it at IndieLive.org. Indie is a standards organization for, for astronomy, like ASCOM, uh, but it's not ASCOM. Uh, I've been using it for about a year now, and it works just as well with the hardware I have as I when I was using Nina, which was using an, uh, um, an ASCOM uh, drivers. In, in this case, I'm using Indie drivers. And you can use it for both electronically assisted astronomy and astrophotography. It consists of two parts. Uh, the, there's a server part, which is the, you might say, the ASCOM server. In this case, it's the Indy server that runs on the Raspberry Pi 4B. That's what this is. Uh, and it's the interface between your scopes hardware and uh, the KSTARS program proper. It's a simple XML-like communications protocol described uh, for interactive and automated remote control of all sorts of uh, astronomy hardware. KSTARS uh, itself, KSTARS proper, is the control processing and planetarium program, and it can run on either the Linux single board computer, the Raspberry Pi, or on your laptop. So you can decide how you want to distribute the software across your system. There are two principal ways to connect. Uh, the first, and I have a picture of them below. So in the first case, you have your telescope with all its parts uh, connected to a computer via USB. And the computer in this case is the Raspberry Pi. And well, so what the Raspberry Pi is doing is it's acting like a data concentrator. It's, it's pulling all the data into one format, either ethernet or Wi-Fi, and send, receiving commands and sending telemetry back to your laptop computer via a router. In that case, uh, the Windows computer, if you're doing astrophotography, is in your house, or you might be running it inside, or you could be out in the field with it, it doesn't really matter. And uh, your PC or, or MacBook is uh, running the planetarium, your PhD guiding, uh, all your image acquisition, all of that complicated math is being done on your laptop. And so the, the Raspberry Pi is lightly loaded as far as the amount of work it has to do. In the second case, all of the key software is running on the Raspberry Pi, and it does work. I've, I've done this with uh, Ubuntu desktop, and it works great. And so in that case, all you need is a VNC or Microsoft Remote Desktop to communicate with the Raspberry Pi, and uh, or any other kind of computer that has a VNC. Uh, does, it would be agnostic of the, uh, of the computer. So the thing I made is the stuff in yellow. And it works with either configuration one or configuration two. All right. If you want, if you didn't want to build one of these, what would you do? 
So in this case, I have uh, other offerings out there that do essentially the same thing. Uh, the one that's the most popular is the ASI Air. And so what I've done is done a trade study to compare these. The ASI Air, the cheapest one they make is, is about 200 bucks. And uh, it supports only ZWO products and some other DSLRs for cameras and all the ZWO external instrumentation like your autofocuser or your filter wheel, things of that nature. And it doesn't support USB 3.0. The next one up the ladder is 300 bucks all the way up to 550 bucks. That's the ASI Plus. Um, it does add USB 3 support and SD card support. And uh, that one uh, is still limited to just ZWO products if you're going to outfit your rig. The third one is the is basically the same as what I have here. It's called StellarMate. StellarMate is the name product of the uh, KSTARS application, uh, but it's being sold by one of the guys, probably the guy who actually wrote most of the code. His name is Jesse Mutlick. I think he, went, he has a computer science degree from the University of Kansas, and I think he's currently living in Kuwait. Uh, so he sells this for $59. And you have to supply the Raspberry Pi and you have to set it up. It's not hard. So if you join the MakerSig, I can show you how to do it. I've actually downloaded this. What's unique about the StellarMate OS is it's the only one I've been able to find that can currently support the Raspberry Pi 5, the most recent incarnation of that single board computer. And finally, uh, he also sells, or his company sells, uh, a hardware device called StellarMate Pro. And you can see pictures of it there. It's it's got the everything the whole kitchen sink um, six hundred bucks for that and I don't know how much it weighs but it's probably not cheap if you want to buy one you can get it at High Point Scientific and there's a review online by some of you know Quiv the Lazy Geek on YouTube he's got a full uh, review of this product uh, okay uh, what I did to build it uh, so I built it on the number one there the design was done in Autodesk Fusion three hundred and sixty. This is just the case. Uh, and then I printed it on Bamboo Labs X1C printer. I assembled the CPU uh, in, and the fan into the, uh, into the plastic case. And then I added the base, this part on the bottom here, uh, with a DC to DC converter that takes your field power supply, whether it's 12, 24 volts, whatever it is, and down converts it to uh, five volts, which is what the Raspberry Pi wants. And then it's pretty simple to build, I'll show you. And then finally, adding and configuring the software, which is where I spent most of the time making this work. And then uh, integrating and test. Uh, the uh, telescope you see there is made by our tonight's speaker, Mr. Vic Maris of Stellar View Corporation. And I'm very happy with it. That's 130 millimeter SBX-130T, if you're curious about the part number. And I currently have it outfitted with ZWO, ASI 2600 camera, electronic autofocuser, and our homebrew maker sig guide scope. Finally, a summary of work to date. Uh, most of the work was focused on getting the software up and running. The device weighs 6.5 ounces. Uh, I accept, successfully implemented both uh, the desktop and server versions of Linux Ubuntu version 22.0.04.13 on the Raspberry Pi board with B with KSTARS. Uh, KSTARS occasionally crashed in configuration one in the diagram below. I found a workaround, uh, it's pretty simple, and I submitted a bug report to the KSTARS distributor KDE. Uh, the performance was nominal with the Windows 11 PC, so this bug I just mentioned is only for the MacBook. It worked, didn't have that bug on the Windows 11 version. Uh, I'm testing with the RPI 5 now with StellarMate OS pre-configured software. Uh, using Linux Debian. And if you'd like to know more about how this is all done, I can, I'm going to give a talk on Wednesday. We have our Maker Sick meeting in agonizing detail about how all this works. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is um, a video created by our member Bill Cast. Um, he takes the time to uh, read in the Astronomical League's reflector every quarter and find our members who have earned Astronomical League observing awards. And he interviews them and gets um, 
all the information he needs to create these videos. So, oh, I thought you had it queued I up. I did, I did. I don't know where it happened to it. <laughs> so in a minute, we'll have that video for you. Okay. But um, I don't know if Bill is in the room tonight virtually. Toby, can you check? I've seen the moments. Okay. All right. Well, the next time you see Bill, thank him for doing this for us because it's uh, it's very nice of him to do this and to acknowledge the hard work of our members who go to the trouble to um, do these observing programs. Um, they're very good for learning how to observe in a manner that is um, teaches you how to become a better observer and uh, teaches you more about the objects that you're learning to observe. It's time to announce the Astronomical League Observing Awards. Pardon. This quarter, DAS has only one award recipient, Mr. Mike Hotka. Mike is an Astronomical League Master Observer and has completed over 60 of the AL observing programs. He has been a DAS member for 20 years. He is also a member of the Longmont Astronomical Society and the Texas Astronomical Society. Mike was recognized in the December 2023 issue of The Reflector. As a DAS member, you are automatically enrolled in the Astronomical League and receive the quarterly issue of The Reflector. Mike was awarded a certificate for completing the telescope level of the Solar Neighborhood Observing Program and his accomplishment was published in the reflector. The program explores our nearest neighboring stars. This image illustrates the brighter stars within 16 light years of our sun. The program doubles that distance to 33 light years or 10 parsecs. There are over 200 known stars in this volume of space. While this list contains a handful of really bright stars such as Sirius and Altair, a majority of them are dim red dwarfs, visible only with a modest telescope. The telescope level of the program requires observation of 100 of these stars. Mike previously completed the 30 observations required by the binocular level of this program and was awarded his certificate and pin last October. Since then, using a combination of telescopes, he observed and carefully recorded another 118 of our solar neighbors. Mike made the following comment. This was a fun and easy observing program to do. It was educational in the fact that I learned of all the stars that are so close to our sun. Most of the stars have a distinct color, which always adds to my observing enjoyment. About half of his observations were made with his 8-inch Newtonian telescope. Mike built this telescope over 20 years ago, including grinding the primary mirror. Most of the remaining observations were made with an 11-inch Cassegrain telescope. This instrument is at the Little Thompson Observatory in Berthoud, Colorado, where Mike does volunteer work. Mike's efforts were rewarded with the telescope-level Solar Neighborhood Certificate. If you are interested in exploring any of the AL observing programs, local help is right around the corner with the DAS Observing Programs Forum. The forums may be accessed via the member portal of the DAS website. There is a handful of dedicated followers of the Observing Program Forum who are willing to offer advice. Visit the forum, hit subscribe, and you will receive an email notification whenever a post is made. Sadly, the DAS forums are an underutilized resource. If you've never visited them, please do so and subscribe to forums that match your areas of interest. Clear skies, and thanks for your attention. So I'm going to introduce you now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Stellar View founder Vic Maris began a lifelong pursuit of astronomy in the mid-1960s after reading the Golden Book of Astronomy. When recalling his earliest memories of astronomy, Vic said, my father bought me a 60 millimeter refractor to encourage my interest in science. But, huh? Oh, thank you. 
<laughs> my father bought a uh, 60 millimeter refractor to encourage my interest in science, but that telescope almost ended my interest in astronomy. Vic fought the telescope for several nights with its wobbly base and defective optics. After many attempts, the telescope was retired to his closet. Far too many telescopes sit unused in closets because companies don't create them uh, with the user in mind. If a telescope is not easy and enjoyable to use, it cannot do what it should. Telescopes ought to foster a greater appreciation for the universe. In spite of his first telescope, Vic continued to be interested in the night sky. Pursuit of astronomy has given me some inspirational experiences. I sincerely appreciate all of those who have helped me along the way. Vic was also lucky to live in Southern California, where some of the best telescope makers were close by and willing to mentor him. Vic polished his first six-inch mirror and made his first telescope at the age of 14. Two years later, he took on the challenge of making a five-inch F-15 refractor at the age of 16. After graduation, Vic excelled in a career working for California State Parks as a ranger and later a superintendent. He worked for the parks for 30 years, during which time he set up educational stargazing programs and also helped establish the Robert Ferguson Observatory. As Vic neared retirement, he taught astronomy for fun in Sacramento, and his students encouraged him to make high-quality, reliable telescope. With this encouragement, Stellarview started in Vic's garage back in 1998. Since then, the company has grown exponentially and produced thousands of handcrafted telescopes. I would like to add that I've owned two of his telescopes and they are wonderful. Uh, please welcome Mr. Vic Maris, president of Stellarview Corporation. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Nice. Okay. We worked through it. So um, I wanted to uh, uh, talk about refractors, but I like to, when I'm talking about refractors, begin at the beginning and give a brief history of the refractor since uh, it does it does answer a lot of questions that people have. So if you'll bear with me, I'd like to uh, do that and start off with uh, the brief history of the refractor. Now, a lot of people think Galileo invented the telescope, which of course isn't true. We don't even, we're, we're not even sure that uh, it was invented by Hans Lippershe, but that's the, that's the common uh, belief that he was the first to make a telescope although he was actually the first to try and patent the telescope, but the king told him that it wasn't uh, you know, a device that was too simple to make, so he couldn't patent it. Now, the interesting thing was that Hans you know, first described it as a kuiper, meaning a looker, or a peeper uh, in Dutch. So the telescope could have been referred to not as a telescope, but as a peeper. And I would just like to say that you probably pretty glad that you're not out in your backyard observing. You don't have to tell your neighbors that you're using your peeper. <laughs> you know, that's a, that could be an issue. Um, and it's really, when you think about it, hard to explain sometimes the things that we as astronomers do. You know, spending all this time uh, with your uh, uh, printer, uh, making a little plastic box, you know, uh, to uh, polishing uh, a lens for two years around a barrel, a five inch F-15 refractor at the age of 16 and finding out 30 years later while you're talking to Sky and Telescope Magazine why you couldn't get that refractor to work because it happened, the same thing happened to the editor, one of the editors for Sky and Tell. Uh, that first refractor I made was made with the wrong glass. The lens kit was sold with the wrong glass. It did teach me, however, how to, how to walk around a barrel. But why do we do it? Why do we go out into the dark, into the into the night? It's kind of hard to explain to people sometimes why we lug our gear out to remote places and spend all night outside. That is until it gets dark. Then it's quite easy for people to understand why we do this. Or when this happens in our own backyard. Uh, it's pretty awesome what we as astronomers get to do and, and get to see and get to appreciate. Um, we've observed the stars through telescopes in our backyards for four centuries now. So I'd like to just have you imagine that you're observing from a backyard in Padua, Italy, and the year is 1609. Well, if you were, then this would be the telescope that you would be using. Um, you would be the first backyard observer, of course, Galileo. 
Now, I don't know if any of you have been to the Galileo Museum in Florence, Italy, but I had the pleasure of actually going there and seeing Galileo's first lens, or it's believed this could be his first lens. This is the Holy Grail of astronomy. Uh, this was the first lens to have, have looked up at the heavens. And it's a really awesome place. If you ever travel to Italy and you get to go to Florence, you definitely need to see Gal the, the uh, Galileo uh, Museum. When you're looking at this lens and you turn around and look behind you, there's a relic. You, Galileo was uh, buried in a uh, heretic's grave, and the church changed their mind finally and moved him out of that grave. And when they did, some people took a relic. And um, this, this was the relic they took, his middle finger. And it's interesting that as I turned and looked at this middle finger, I could swear it was pointed at the Vatican. But that's another story. <laughs> now, some of you may know, I don't, some people know that I sometimes dress up as Galileo uh, when I'm doing my interpretive programs in parks and stuff and I, I'm talking about astronomy. I will often get into costume uh, as Galileo. At the Neef show, we do kind of silly things where, you know, we have the Pope, Pope Urban, chasing Galileo around. And the last time we did this, uh, uh, Rolling Christian's daughter, Karen, uh, dressed as Galileo's daughter, but but in a miniskirt. Um, so, you know, we, we, we like to enjoy uh, what we do in astronomy. At the Galileo Museum, I walked around the corner and my wife said, don't move. And I stood still. I said, what? She goes, don't move. She lifted her camera and she snapped this picture. Um. You know, if you look at the nose in particular, <laughs> you know, I could be the reincarnation of Galileo. I don't know. But uh, that was my wife's theory anyway. The thing about Galileo, now to get back on topic, is that he did do a lot of really cool things for, with the first telescope used in a backyard to look up at the stars. You know, he saw the craters on the moon, the phases of Venus, the moons of Jupiter. He, he actually was able to, to measure the rotation of the sun by looking at the sunspots. He knew there was something weird going on with Saturn, but his telescope wasn't big enough to resolve what it was. But he said there was something different about it. And then, of course, he looked at the Milky Way and saw that the Milky Way was actually comprised of multitudes of stars. Pretty amazing the number of things he discovered using a telescope, you know, no larger than this. The problem with those early telescopes is that they were made with single elements. And a single element lens acts like a prism. Uh, the white light hits it, goes through the glass, and it disperses the colors into all of the different colors of the, of the uh, spectrum. And so this separation of visible light into the different colors known as dispersion is bad. It creates color error in telescopes. And so we don't like dispersion. We like to minimize dispersion. Color error in a single element telescope is excessive since the lens acts like the prism. And you can see that all the different colors would come to focus in a different place. Um, it, the, oh, and the dispersion is greater if the lens is shorter. In other words, if it's a shorter focal length lens, the distance between the colors will be greater. So they would often t do things like stop down a telescope. Here's Galileo's, the front of Galileo's telescope. You can see the lens was stopped down to make it effectively a longer focal length lens. This got to be pretty crazy about Galileo's time. You know, in 1670, Johann Havelovus, uh, he made a refractor, a six-inch refractor, but a single-element refractor had to be 150 feet in length, and even so, it produces this weird chromatic image. Uh, by the way, this is not what we call a grab-and-go telescope, just in case you were wondering. I like to dis explain color crossings by uh, doing it in a way that astronomers like us who have used telescopes can understand. We can plot out how these different lenses perform if we use a graph. And on the vertical axis, you have the wavelength, you know, all the different colors of the rainbow, if you will. And on the horizontal axis, you have the focuser position. So if you're at zero on the graph, your focuser is racked halfway out. 
if you're at plus 10, you're racked all the way out. If you're negative 10, you're racked all the way in. Does that make sense? This is, this is the focuser position versus the wavelength. Through a single element lens, this is what comes to focus. You can see that it only has one color crossing. So if you are at zero um, on the focuser, you're only seeing in, in, in focus purple. But if you're at plus five, now you're seeing green in focus. So it must have been very frustrating to use these single element lenses. Now, uh, when Galileo died that same year, Newton was born. And of course, Newton was a highly respected uh, scientist who invented the, tele the reflecting telescope. That's why we call it a Newtonian reflector. Newton claimed that false color could never be corrected in a lens. And since he carried a lot of weight, most people believe that and gave up on the, on the uh, refractor. Newton didn't realize, though, that it was possible to combine lenses that disperse colors differently and use them together to cancel out their respective dispersive properties. But a few people did. And there was this search going on trying to figure out how you could make a refractor that was color free. One of the people doing that search was Chester Moore Hall. Chester Moore Hall was a barrister, which means he was an attorney. So, you know, you could understand that he, he wanted to discover this thing and then he could uh, put a, make a patent for it. So we're not sure, but we think that it was either 1729 or 1733 that he designed a lens to reduce color error. He used a flint and a crown element together. And he wanted to keep this secret when he went to make the prototype. So he used two different optical companies, one for each element, thinking that this would keep the secret. But his plan backfired. And the reason this plan backfired was both of these optical companies hired a subcontractor and it was the same guy. <laughs> so George Bass uh, gets these two contracts for two lenses that are the same diameter and the inner curves are the same curves. So once he built these lenses for these companies, he put them together and looked through it and figured out that he had been looking through the first achromatic doublet. Acromats have two color crossings. So if you could look around the yellow zone there, you can see that all those colors are pretty much in focus. But if you get down into purple, now you're out of focus. So two color crossings can really correct the color, but you're still going to have that purple fringe. So when you look through your TASCO telescope, uh, your 60 millimeter telescope that you got when you were a kid, and you see false color, well, that's not that does, that's not the potential that can be reached with a refractor, but most people have acromats, and so, you know, they, they think that. Um, anyway, so here's this guy, George Bass, walking around with his secret, and you've got Chester Moore Hall, who never actually filed for a patent. So then in 1750, Bass mentioned Hall's lenses to John Dolan, who was in the carpet business. He was quite wealthy. Dolan applied for and was granted a patent in 1758 and started making Dolan Acromats, the first commercial achromatic refractors, for which he had a patent on for at least a while. These were awesome because they only had a slight amount of color error and they were as fast as F16. Look at that telescope he's looking through. You know, that was considered a short tube telescope back then. <laughs> so uh, certainly a lot shorter than Hevelius's. So we still have, we have what is called an acromat, but we still have that purple fringe, as you can see around the star. So enter Ernest Abba. Ernest Abb headed the Zeiss company. Abba was a genius when it came to designing and fabricating optics and to develop optical theory and the math behind it. Abba reorganized Zeiss and he gave workers better pay and benefits professionalizing them. He really made a difference in the Zeiss company. And Ab invented the first color-free microscope lens in 1868. It took 10 elements, but he was able to disperse out all of the false color. This truly color-free objective was known as an apochromat. He also was the first to use calcium fluorite crystal in making an extra-low dispersion lens in the late 1800s. Uh, fluorite and super ED glass can be used to make an apochromat with as little as two to three elements because they don't disperse the color. 
this glass does the opposite of what a prism does. It, it really keeps those colors close together. That's why when you want to buy a, a truly color-free uh, refractor, you definitely want to use very, very low dispersion glass. This is the three color crossings that happen with a refractor, an APO. Uh, all of the colors are in focus. Uh, you have a truly color-free telescope. So to review, an acromat means no color compared to a single element lens that has no color, but there's a purple fringe, whereas an apochromat means seriously no color. And this lens brings the three widely spaced colors into common focus, making it truly color-free. So now that we understand how the refractor evolved, let's look at the differences between premium refractors and reflectors and premium refractors and the imposters. You know, um, reflectors in the real world cost less, much less. You only have one surface that you that you uh, need to uh, to figure and polish. You have lower contrast, but this is offset when mirrors are exceptionally well figured. And there's quite a quite a variety of uh, quality when it comes to reflectors. Reflectors like Newtonians have tube currents. They can be partially offset with fans, but these open tube telescopes, uh, images are going to tend to boil more than they are in a closed tube telescope. They show varying degree of detail on the planets depending on the optics. They may require some assembly on site and collimation. Everybody's used to this. Generally, they require lifting and transporting heavy, heavier components. Uh, it's, but it's the telescope to buy if you're willing to set up and haul a larger telescope and you enjoy deep sky objects. You're not going to be looking at Stefan's Quintet through a 60 millimeter refractor. In comparison, true premium Apo refractors perform perfectly without ever needing collimination. There's, there's an advantage. They provide the highest contrast. There is no central obstruction. They perform free of tube currents in, that you see in open tube telescopes. They show extremely fine detail on the planets. They provide an extremely wide field of view in comparison. They allow the user to exceed Dawes limit. A high-end Apple refractor on a very steady night can be taken up to 100 power per inch with no degradation. They show all of the above in a relatively small, compact, transportable package. And of course, they're well known for emptying your wallet. So those are the advantages. The thing about uh, refractors is that there are many issues that compromise um, telescopes that people are unaware of. And, and since most nights are fairly turbulent, people can't always tell a good telescope from a bad telescope. Glass is the first thing. Um, there's different grades of glass, and glass can have within it strains and striae. Uh, when companies uh, melt glass and they do it very uh, quickly or relatively quickly, uh, uh, inhomogeneity happens. You, you, get, uh, you get the glass cooling too fast and you'll see either short range inhomogeneity, which is called striae, or you can see long range inhomogeneity that goes across the whole glass. And inhomogeneity it is sort of like saying consistency, the consistency of glass. You can see the grade A on the left has very consistent glass. And that means it's got very consistent dispersion. And the one on the right, the grade C glass, not, not very good. I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna change as you go through the glass. And um, most Chinese refractors that are inexpensive are made with grade, grade C glass. So there are a lot of other problems with making refractors. Um, if you have a, a refractor with a lens that's 130 millimeter or larger, and it's an airspace lens, and you use an aluminum cell, um, that aluminum cell is going to expand and contract at a rate far greater than the glass itself. And so when we make 130 millimeter or larger refractors, we switch to a steel cell. And we learned that from LZOS in Russia. They made lenses that they launched in missiles, and uh, they, they, they really had their act together when it came to knowing about taking lenses into very cold environments like in space. And so 
we borrowed that idea from them and we used our we use steel cells. Now more companies are using steel cells for airspace lenses that are 130 millimeter or larger. Um, optics, of course, use curved surfaces to bend light. The accuracy of the curved surface, uh, how close they come to an ideal spherical shape will really determine how sharp the image is. Um, accuracy is measured in wavelengths of light. As many of you know, uh, it's a very small measurement. A piece of paper is 200 waves thick. The optical wavefront really must be polished and figured accurately to within about a 20th wave RMS to really form the sharpest image. That's pretty, that's pretty small difference uh, when you think about it. Piece of paper, 200 waves thick. You got to make the, the curve perfect to within 1 20th of a wave. So what's the real, real world result of having more accurate optics? Um, one of the ways that I got to see this in person was a night that I was spent, I spent up in the Sierra, right where I'm located here, um, just about 45 minutes um, is the uh, Blue Canyon Airport. And the Blue Canyon Airport is where our astronomy club goes, the, Los, uh, the uh, Sacramento Valley Astronomical Society. And we, uh, we put our telescopes on the tarmac of the airport. There's some domes there that the club has. And uh, it, it's not unusual to have 30, 40, 50 telescopes out on a new moon night in, uh, on, on the weekend in the summer. And in 19, I think it was 1985, uh, I was observing now... I had stopped making telescopes. I had gone off to frolic in parks for 30 years and uh, do that career. And I was just getting back kind of into astronomy and didn't have the time to make a telescope. So my wife suggested I just buy one. So I bought a short tube SCT telescope and I was observing with it this night. And I was I'm observing, I looked at Saturn and Saturn had the same view that it always had, you know, I could see Cassini's division, but not any real detail. I didn't think it was a very good night. I got heard these guys behind me saying, wow, super seeing. And I said, what do you mean super seeing? And they said, oh, it's sub arc second seeing. It's amazing. And I look back at Saturn, you know, and I'm seeing Saturn like I always, uh, I always see it. You know, it's, it's, it looks, you know, I, 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 I said, this can't be super seeing. What, what size telescope are you using? And the guy behind me said, I'm using a six inch. And I said, well, I'm using an eight inch. I, I don't see this as being anything particularly. He said, well, come on over and take a look. And I go, well, what, who made your telescope? And he said, Roland Christian made my telescope. And Roland Christian, oh, he's the owner of astrophysics. So I went through and looked through an astrophysics refractor for the first time. And this is what I saw. Now, I went back and looked at my telescope. And that was literally the last time I ever looked through my telescope. <laughs> well, this was amazing. We were under this incredible steady air. There were 50 telescopes on the hill that night. So we did a survey. We had everybody point at Saturn. It was the, the word went out. This, this is, we're under super seeing conditions, sub arc second seeing conditions. And the result of the survey using 50 telescopes was that the astrophysics six inch F12 refractor showed us we were under perfect conditions. There was one 22 inch obsession with a very well figured galaxy mirror. And there were two reflectors that were made with mirrors that were made by John Hall, who was a, who was a really good mirror maker prior to Zambudo. I mean, it, this was back in the, yeah, this was back in quite a, quite a long time ago and he's no longer with us, but those telescopes showed beautiful images of Saturn. Every other telescope on the hill, dozens of them, showed the same soft image of Saturn, including a lot of short, stubby tube telescopes that were there, a lot of commercial telescopes, and may I say, some that said they were diffraction limited. When somebody says that a telescope is diffraction limited, well, <laughs> all I can tell you is what we saw. So I've never really uh, understood why people use diffraction limited as a term. Well, I understand optically why, but I don't understand it in the real world. There's also a different impression that you get when you look through a refractor. 
you know, through an SCT, you look at M13 and you can resolve it to the core. It's beautiful. You see this wonderful ball of stars. But through a refractor, it just looks differently. You know, it, the sky background is pitch black. The stars are pinpoints. There's just a different feeling when you look through a premium refractor at a globular cluster. Uh, you know, it may be to your liking. It may be not. Accuracy is what we're looking for. And, of course, people talk a lot about Strill ratio. Carl Strill was the, uh, the one that came up with expressing the accuracy of an optic in terms of the intensity of light that's in the center airy disk. A perfect optic would contain 83% of the light in the airy disk of the star, the center ball. About 7% should be in the first ring and less than 3% in the rest. Now, if you've got more than 7% in the first ring, you've probably got spherical aberration. And a big fat second first ring is, is going to really indicate that. Um, this would be a perfect optic, and it would have a sterile ratio of 1.0. Of course, nothing in nature can be perfect, so a 0.99 would be about the most accurate optic you can make. A strill ratio of 0.95, which is a very high rating, was attained by Zeiss. Uh, they stopped uh, 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 publishing the numbers. LOMO and LZOS in Russia also started making telescopes that were 0.95, and they really stood out 20 years ago as very, very sharp refractors. Mass-produced commercial telescopes are generally about 0.8 strill or higher. Uh, the target or standard for Chinese refractors, according to two senior Chinese opticians I spoke with, is about 0 0.90, which is about a fifth or sixth wave uh, peak of valley. A general strill number alone does not identify where the issues are, though. So using strill ratio can be very misleading. A high strill telescope can still have one or two major issues, uh, believe it or not. So we do not try to hit a strill number. That is not what we're doing. When we figure our optics, what we try to do is minimize the common aberrations that are seen in machine polished lenses. That's the, that's the magic we do. And it's not really magic, it's just real hard work, as we'll show you here in just a moment. As we correct the most serious aberrations, we see other errors appear that were hidden by the larger errors. And so we work on correcting all of these errors through dozens and dozens of optical rubbing sessions. The more errors we reduce, the higher the strill ratio becomes. In the end, there's nothing there that will degrade the CMOS or CCD image or the visual view. But, and in doing that, getting rid of those aberrations, our strill number goes up to a very high number. But we're not trying to do a high strill number. We're trying to get rid of aberrations. And I try and make this clear on forums when we're talking about it, because people will criticize us for using a strill ratio. But really, strill ratio is just where we end up after we get rid of all the problems. We use the industry standard zygo phase shifting laser interferometer to map the wavefront. Using the zygo and their developed Metro Pro software, we can create an accurate map of the wavefront that is they refer to as an oblique plot, and the plot maps the errors, uh, and master opticians can then correct the errors one at a time. So the zygo is set up vertically because we want to lay the lens down, pointing up, so we can loosen the retainer and there'll, there'll be no pressure on the on the glass. And then uh, it, they we use a, a sphere at the bottom that. Um, will allow the light to pass twice through the lens at full aperture, and then we can produce a test. It's a lot of fun for me to test competitive lenses. Uh, this is a competitive lens that we tested that's peak to valley 0.463 waves. You can see what I talked about when I said the airy disc, that first ring shouldn't be really fat, because this lens has spherical aberration. You can see that airy disc that's that little star in the middle there, has a very fat first ring. You can also see on the fringe map to the left of it, those bars are supposed to look like jail bars, but the spherical error makes it really clear. So the test report that we do is really helpful in being able to identify the issues that are in any particular lens. 
And in this case, the fringes aren't straight and the first diffraction ring is too large. Too much energy there. It's got spherical error. A very common problem is astigmatism. And astigmatism is when the wave front looks like a potato chip. And that commonly uh, lenses come off the uh, polishing machine with astigmatism and they really distort things. Um, basically, if light is, if I use an arrow, is that showing? Yeah. Okay, so obviously light that hits this low spot is gonna focus to a different spot than light that points at the high spot. It's gonna focus to a different place. It's gonna really distort your airy disc. So astigmatism mm -hmm. is a very common issue. There's another issue called trefoil that nobody ever talks about. Uh, trefoil is when you have three low spots or high spots. And what that does is it makes the star appear like a triangle. If you've seen telescopes that have triangular stars, you've seen a telescope that's got trefoil. There's three different things that can cause that. One is the retainer ring is too tight on the telescope. That's an easy fix. But in a lot of the lenses coming in from overseas, we're seeing this either in the glass itself because of long range inhomogeneity, or we're seeing it because of the polishing technique they're using. And I know exactly what they're doing wrong, and I'm not going to tell anybody <laughs> because I don't, I think, I think the Chinese have got too much of the market already. But it's a very common thing. You can look at it, you can figure it out, and, uh, a lot of this happens uh, in uh, lenses that I've tested that people have brought by and we've looked at, we've seen a lot of trefoil. This is an interesting one because it's got spherical air and uh, trefoil both. So you can see you got the triangular star and you've got this, this weird shape. Um, we're using an interferometer, a zygo interferometer that uses a red heaney laser. That's the industry standard. But of course, these lenses were actually developed, uh, designed, and, and made in green light. And so what this should have in a red interferometer is a shape that looks sort of like a W for it to be actually perfect. It's got, this one has a shape like an M. If you can see on the cross section, the, this curve is going exactly the wrong way. So uh, this this one is, is really a bad lens. Uh, this This lens has quite a history behind it. Um, a customer called, he bought one of our giant field flatteners, and he said, um, I don't think your field flattener works very well. Uh, it's not imaging well through my telescope. And I said, well, uh, what telescope? And he told me what it was. And I said, well, you realize that telescope was made in China. And yeah, I said, well, have you looked through the scope? Can you tell me what the star test looks like? And he said, well, I'm only an imager. I, I, I never looked through the scope. And he goes, and I, I want to image with it. I'm, I'm going to Nightfall, which is an event down in Southern California that we have at Anza Borrego Desert State Park. I said, well, I'm giving a talk there. So I'm, I'm going to be there. Um, I'll bring some eyepieces. And let's take a look through your scope. So I met him and I looked through his scope. Worst star test I've ever seen. And I showed it to him and explained it to him. And so I said, I'll tell you what, I'll take your telescope and the reducer back and we'll zygo test it. And I, that's where I got the zygo test. Well, anyway, the guy sells the scope you know, on cloudy nights or Astromart, whatever. And he buys one of our 130s and he loves it. Everything works great. About 30 days later, I get a call from a guy. Hey, I bought one of your field flatteners. I don't think it works very well. Um, I realized at that point, I probably should have just bought the telescope from him rather than having this telescope go from person to person to person. Um, you know, everybody, nobody's going to admit they've got a bad telescope. There's a lot of telescopes that have optics that are not so good. This is where we do our optical work. This is one of the buildings that we have, and this is our optical shop. And this is where we do the testing. So right here, you see Alex, my production manager, looking through a telescope that's hitting a 10th wave uh, zero door optical flat. And from there, from the optical flat, it goes back to the light source, which is behind him. And all he's doing is he's uh, aligning the telescope uh, optically with a artificial star. This is the zygo interferometer here, attached to an anti-vibration table. It's extremely heavy table on pistons. It floats, even though it floats and it's very heavy and it does everything. When the train goes by about a half mile away, we have to wait until it passes because it does vibrate. 
that's how sensitive this machine is. And then here's our double pass auto columnator underneath that we can look at the lenses in different colors with. And then here's four spindles that we use to do the um, figuring of the optics once we've ground and polished them. So that's this is where it all happens. I want to talk about wavefront. I mentioned the word wavefront a couple of times. We're trying to make a perfect wavefront. Well, in a reflector, it's easy to understand the wavefront because the, you only have one surface that's that's polished and figured. The shape of this is the wavefront, but it's different, of course, in a triplet objective. You've got six surfaces, and these six surfaces create a wavefront just like the mirror does. So when we're talking about wavefront, we're talking about not the shape of the individual surface of the mirror, but we're talking about the wavefront created by six different surfaces. It's a lot trickier to do a refractor than a reflector because you've got six different surfaces you have to deal with. Uh, this is a test report uh, from the last 152 we, we made. So I just thought I'd grab one and show you what our test report looks like on our 152. You can see it's got a nice, beautiful airy disc. Um, it's got a lot of energy in the center. The a fringe map, the bars are straight like jail bars. Um, it's got this uh, this curve that's kind of like a W. Uh, it, this this would be absolutely flat if the if we used a green laser instead of a red laser, but Zygo doesn't do that. Um, they use a red laser. There's very little difference between the, the colors actually. So I just wanted to show you what one of our test reports look like. Um, here's um, Here's what the Zygo can do for us. It can create a map, a wavefront map. And we can use that when we want to um, polish the lens. We can mark the lens and we can know exactly where to do the rubbing. So um, uh, back to here, uh, we basically will do the optical test here, and then we'll go into the clean room, which is here. We'll disassemble the lens. We'll determine which element needs to be polished. We'll bring it back down here and we'll polish it. We then, uh, we're only touching it for about five minutes, by the way. Uh, and we're fixing things. Now let's say the lens just came off the polishing machine, or yeah, just came out of polishing and we're just starting to refigure it. And what problem do we have here? Can anybody tell? We talked about it earlier. It's got a characteristic shape. Is the sound on? Yeah. Okay. Looks it's like a potato chip. chip. It looks like a potato chip. Yeah, yeah. So it has astigmatism. And the thing is, this astigmatism is covering up all the other aberrations that, that lie underneath it. And so when we polish the astigmatism out, you know, the same lens, this is the same lens looks like this. And so if you look at the difference in waves, negative to positive, you can see that we've now got this thing to a, a very accurate uh, polish. And it's flat because we're going to fix these aberrations in red light to begin with. So this is what we do. And this is the magic behind Stellar View. We zygote test the, and map the wavefront. We do an analysis to determine what figuring is needed. In the clean room, we disassemble it. We mount the element to the polishing machine, and we precision polish. We do the rubbing that we need to do. It takes a master optician to know where to rub using this, uh, using the oblique plot. We then clean the element. We reassemble the objective. We let the objective cool overnight because we've been rubbing it. It's got to cool overnight. Then we have to align it, completely align it again, which takes a lot more time than the rubbing. And then we test it again. And we go around and around and around with this process day after day, week after week, for maybe a month, maybe two months, maybe three months, until we get it to the point where all the aberrations are gone. Once the aberrations are gone, then we do our final rubs to move the center of correction to green light. So we end up with lenses that are 
that have the most accurate part of, of their polishing in green light. Why do we do this? Well, we do that because we're now using CMOS cameras. We used to use CCD cameras that were most sensitive to red. Now they're green and the human eye sees in green. And people bugged me in the spring of last year that our lenses should be centered in green, not in red. Now, what's silly about this is that you have a difference between when we do this, we do our 152 in red light. In green light, okay, in red light, it's 0.99 strill. In green light, it's 0.98. <laughs> so there's very little difference. It's way beyond the accuracy that anyone else uses. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Here's a uh, lens number 118. We happen to do a D-pack on this one to show how accurate the lens is in all three colors, blue, green, and red. But now we've centered it in red. So these are the straightest bars of the three. Um, and so with the 152, uh, we can get it up to a high strill ratio. With our F7 telescopes, the strill ratios have dropped from 9.9 to about 9.8 because we're now centering not in red, but in green. Does that make sense? Uh, we're just trying to finalize our polishing by centering um, in green. So it's kind of cool having all this wonderful test equipment that we can use uh, to, to actually make the most accurate lenses we can. And the results are pretty stunning. These are some pictures taken through our Stellar View SVX uh, 180 refractor, which is our flagship. Helix, of course. Uh, the clarity in these things, uh, in these telescopes, have been absolutely stunning. Uh, these images were taken by Nicola in Spain, Tony Hallis in California. And we even have, we have a movie of Jupiter that's amazing with a satellite going around it. You can see it on our website. So the results of having ac optics this accurate are, are pretty stunning. And this isn't all Photoshop, folks. This is These images were really sharp in the raw form. Can anybody tell what that is? All right. Yeah. Pretty awesome. It's, you know, for those of, uh, of you like myself who have looked at it uh, all, of, all, of, all of our lives, you know, but we've never quite seen it like that. You know, it's it's really pretty amazing how how these incredibly sharp telescopes can can do such a great job, um, especially when people who know what they're doing are using them. So those are some of the images taken with our uh, 180, which is our flagship telescope. And that ends the presentation. Okay, I have a question. Yay. Yay. Uh, yeah, it was great. That was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so I have your SVX 130T. I've had it for like, uh, I have like one of the first ones that went to hit the uh, streets. And uh, my question is, uh, you know, with those kinds of precision manufacturing, what uh, should I bring the scope back every few years just to have a tune up or does it, does it hold that? Strell ratio. I mean, if if I leave it, if I'm taking imaging at night and it's, it gets below freezing, you know, is there stress played on uh, placed on the collimation or anything like that that I need to worry about? Yeah, the accuracy leaks out, so you need to send it in every year, and we'll charge you about five hundred dollars to <laughs> put the accuracy back in. Uh, <clears throat> no, that's the beautiful thing about refractors is they're they're pretty they're pretty permanently aligned. Um, you know, unless you see any issues, uh, we do, you know, people want to have us occasionally clean uh, a telescope, like every three or four years, they'll say, can you, can we send it in? Can you clean it and check the alignment? We check the alignment and unless they've dropped it or done something radical to it, um, the alignments are, are, are pretty much rock solid. The SVX telescopes have um, a, a flanges both on the lens side and on the focuser side so we can get the thing perfectly aligned and then we lock everything down real tight. Alex has real strong wrists and uh, he locks everything down real tight. In fact, customers get it and they go, I can't unlock the focuser lock knob, you know. 
And I, I keep trying. You can do it. You can. But Alex is just really. He wants to make sure everything gets there. And you know. And then, and then I don't know. When did you get your one thirty? Uh, it's serial number four hundred or something. So I guess it was like two years ago, three years ago. Oh, okay. So you when may have first, gotten yeah. it. You, you may have gotten it uh, before Bria, my uh, office manager, uh, took a job with us. She made it a real issue to never have a telescope damaged in shipment, and so she triple boxes everything. Yeah, somebody, it was really well packed. Yeah, somebody. I mean, she's like a Jenga queen. She's with all the <laughs> foam that's in there with the triple boxing and everything. We've sent the one eighties to Thailand. We've sent them to Spain. We sent them to Switzerland. No, no issues. Wow. But people think that you just received at your at your garage a refrigerator. You know, in the. <laughs> <laughs> with UPS, so, uh, but it's of course the telescope in there somewhere, you know, inside of its box. So yeah, it's if you see any issues, you know, if you want to clean, we'll clean it. It, it takes a while uh, because we're continually doing like thirty six lenses at a time, and we can't just shut down the zygo, you know, to to do that. We have to keep keep going. But what'll happen is we'll we won't get a an order of uh, lenses from the coding lab when they say we will. You know, because we're they're across country, so you know FedEx or UPS or whatever. So when that happens, we have a day. We'll go through all of the war all the warranties and all of the you know things that people send in. Like, can you clean this for us and stuff? We don't really get too many. You know, we don't really get too many returns. What we get are people who drop their telescope like on the concrete and stuff. Oh wow! So then we will take it in at that point. The nice thing is, you call us up. You talk to us, we speak your language, and, um, you know, we're astronomers, and we don't want to make a profit on your misfortune. So we we stand behind our telescopes. If there's any manufacturing defect, there is no limit on the warranty, um, but because you know, we really don't have any manual. We have had a few, actually, uh, things that that broke free and stuff, and we fixed them, even though they were like six, seven years old. But we have a two-year, you know, basic warranty. And, uh, um, so, you know, um, but, um, you know, people break things sometimes, you know, people will do things though. The, the most, um, the most threatening thing there is the thing that you have to really watch out for is carrying your refractor through a doorway and having that fine focus knob hit the door jam. Oh. That's the most sensitive part of a telescope is the fine focus knob. And once you whack that knob, you might have to replace the entire pinion thing underneath. It's like $300. So that's the one thing you always want to be real careful with is the fine focus knob on any telescope because it is the weak link. So anyway. Well, thank you, Vic. Yeah. Questions. Any other questions for Vic? We've got online too. Yeah, or, or you could, you know, there could be questions for Galileo. Um, you know, it's, you know. <laughs> So, so I'm curious. I, I'm also a, a mirror grinder. I, I ground an eight inch when I was 14 years old. Nice. And I've forgotten about the barrel bit until you said it. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious with these lenses, that, and I mean, you're talking of incredibly high accuracy. How long does it take to, to complete a set for a telescope? And, and how is that viable in a business sense? Because I imagine it's not quick. No, it takes a it takes a year to make to make our an objective, wow. but okay. but it's not when when we say it took a year to make your lens, people think we work on that lens for a solid year. No, we work on that lens once once it's ground and polished. And grinding and polishing is any optical shop can do that. Any optical shop right. can grind and polish. Right. But we're talking about the figuring that we do. Yeah. The figuring is only done for like five minutes or even three minutes at a time. I mean, you're because you're we're removing so little material in a specific spot right. that it's only two or three minutes at a time, but then it's got to cool overnight. And you got to do that whole got to do the whole thing, the assembly, the testing. I mean, I'm really lucky that I have people with just the right amount of OCD and ADHD <laughs> that they can do this because literally I would kill myself if I, oh, yeah, I did the assembly. kind of production work that we're doing all day long, every day. But these guys love it because and they're really challenged and they really want to. The, the way we got into doing this was, and the, we got all this test equipment because we had some, we were doing defense optics. And so we were able to get state-of-the-art equipment that nobody else has in doing that commercial work. 
And so then we were doing our own optics and we were just awesome. machine polishing awesome. them and that kind of thing. And Alex, my production manager, this was probably four or five years ago now, was looking at the test star as I walked by and he goes, wow. And I go, what? And he goes, look at this. So I looked at this and it was a perfect, perfect airy disc, a perfect star test. I said, wow, Alex, this is really a good one. And he smiled and he goes, yeah, I have a confession to make. I've been working on it for six months. Hmm. He kept putting it aside and keep and, and, and kept improving it. And he goes, Vic, we got to do this. I said, do you realize it, we're going to be, we're going to price ourselves out of business. He goes, doesn't matter. You know, you can buy cheap telescopes. You can buy, you know, this is going to be different. And he convinced me immediately that we needed to do that. And, and that's why we've done it. And so we've chosen to only take 5% of the market. We've chosen to just okay. go to people that are very, very discriminating. And, you know, our feeling is that people are going to eventually find us. They're going to eventually get fed up with the telescopes that they've been struggling with for years and they're going to save up and they're going to they're going to they're going to do it. I mean, look, you know, Joe was a sucker two times with us, right? <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's a happy uh, sucker. That was Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, we have another question. Yeah. Uh from Ron Rannick. Uh so he says some APOs use airspace elements and some use oil space elements. Is there an advantage to one versus the other? Yeah. Uh, the um, I want to I want to be careful here because I don't want to I don't want to sound like I'm I'm dissing uh, Yuri. He's a great guy and he makes an incredible refractor. He makes oil space refractors and we make airspace uh, refractors. Um, I prefer uh, airspace lenses because the designer it has a lot more freedom in creating six different curved surfaces that are independent of each other. When you do an oil space lens, uh, the inner surfaces have to be exactly the same. So we can get um, uh, a very high spherochromatic correction by doing airspace lenses. We did oil space for a while. We did a 130 and a 160 for a while. It was a mess. I hated doing it. You don't have to coat the inner surfaces, so it's cheaper. You don't need uh, very precision um, uh, rings between the lenses, you know, spacer rings. But it's better to, for us, it's better to do airspace lenses. And I think Roland uh, now at Astrophysics is doing uh, combination oil and air. One of the surfaces is airspace, so he could get a little better correction. But that's why we do airspace. Thank you. Any other questions for Vic? No? Well. OK. Well, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. So yeah, thank you. And Arriva Dirce Galileo. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Now is the uh, time of the meeting where we have observing reports. Has anybody had the ability to do any observing lately? OK. All right. Um, Yes. Oh, thank you. Ron Rennick, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, I dragged one of my telescopes outside today. The sun was shining for the first time in, in quite a while. So I um, set the set my 85 millimeter refractor up with a white light solar filter and took a look at the sun. And solar cycle 25 continues to entertain with sunspots galore. Um, if the weather cooperates in the next few days, I would encourage those of you with the ability to, to do safe um, solar observing to take advantage of what uh, solar cycles dished up uh, or is dishing up. The, the several sunspots are much larger than the earth. They're visible right now. Um, the sun is continuing to be active for those of you who follow space weather. There were, I think I got two alerts for M-class flares today. So the sun is very busy, but it's it's sure looking good. And it was nice to be able to drag the scope out and take a look at it today. Good, very good. Yes, last evening uh, I was uh, outside with a friend and uh, we noticed that uh, the sky was nice and clear, but neither of us had planned to set a telescope up, but sure wished we had. It was a, a beautiful evening last night. Steve Barr, go ahead. 
don't know if anybody else would be interested in this or not, but however, I, in the Silver Street Galaxy, there is a, that would be NGC 7216, I believe. Uh, you, there is a supernova going off a type 1A supernova. Uh, you will have to get up early in the morning, like between three and four, well, at least from the pinery and where I am, con considering all the obstructions I have. But uh, yeah, I have been sort of struggling for the last two weeks for an opportune DT, get a uh, spectrum of it with no luck whatsoever. So if anybody's interested in supernovas anyway, it is clearly outshining uh, the rest of the galaxy if anybody would want to take a look at it. About uh, the galaxy and the supernova are bo both around magnitude 12 right now. Great, thank you for the information. Hopefully we will have some people in the club who will do that and give us some pictures or some spectrography about that. That would be wonderful, thank you. Any other observing reports or attempted observing? Okay, very good. I would like to thank Dan Ray and Joe Godwin Austin for tackling the uh, problem of the dome at Chamberlain yet again. There is a new belt on it and uh, it seized up again even after the new belt was on, but they went back and <clears throat> fixed a problem with some lubrication. So. Hopefully the dome will continue to turn without any trouble for quite a while now. Thank you so much for doing that. We appreciate you. And I think that wraps it up for tonight. So thank you all of you who, who made it into the meeting. Um, and uh, we will see you again soon. Thank you so much.